All right, and welcome back to the Medfield TV live election debate. As we continue tonight, we have our two Senate candidates now on stage. Joining us is current Senator Paul Feeney. Thank you so much for joining us. As well as candidate Jacob Ventura. Thank you. Just like we did with the representatives, we open with a three-minute opening statement, and the first comes from Senator Feeney. Thank you, Brett, Medfield TV, and our panelists for hosting this program. Thanks to all of you, both here and at home, for taking the time to get to know us and for being an engaged voter. It is an honor and a privilege to serve as the state senator from our district, and I treasure the opportunity that I have to campaign for re-election. When I ran last year, I made it clear that we were going to do politics differently and that I would serve with passion for the people of our district above all else. I have honored that commitment and have delivered for our district while fighting for our families and sticking up for our values. As a public servant, I am guided by those values learned through hard work in the private sector where I spent most of my life. In the last year, I've held dozens of district office hours, attended hundreds of events, and met with seniors in their homes, constituents in their communities, and early morning commuters at train stations throughout our district. My staff and I are frequently at the center over on Ice House Road, downstairs at the Medfield Library, and even camped out in the corner of Blue Moon, meeting with seniors, families, young people, and everyone in between. To be an effective senator, one must listen more than they speak. In those thousands of conversations that I've had with people throughout Medfield and our district, I've seen and heard firsthand the anxiety, both economic and otherwise, that so many of us feel. That anxiety is real. I hear you. I feel it myself. That is why I'm proud of my record of standing up for us in the Massachusetts Senate. I am proud to have a 100% voting record since taking the oath of office and believe that our elected officials should be present, should be bold, and should, and should lead. Through my votes and my actions, I have done just that. Shortly after taking office, I co-sponsored a comprehensive bill that would adjust the antiquated school funding formula and provide additional resources for our public schools. Additionally, I joined with other senators in passing a bill to lower health insurance and prescription costs. I stood up for women and fought for measures to protect health care rights in the face of attacks from the Trump administration and will continue to fight for laws that demand equal pay for equal work. I fought for our environment and against pipelines and compressor stations. I advocated for funding for the arts and creative community. I supported bills this year that strengthen services for veterans and their families, that invest in 21st century jobs and economic growth in this region, as well as legislation that provides resources to those suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. Here in Medfield, I was proud to join with Representative Garlic and Dooley to secure $30,000 in funding for suicide prevention in our community. I stand up for our district because I'm from here. I am invested in our communities, and I believe that we deserve a voice. I promised that I would never let politics get in the way of progress. I have proudly kept that promise and will continue to do so. I hope I have earned your trust, and I ask for your vote for re-election on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you. Thank you. And our next opening statement is from candidate Ventura. Well, thank you, Brett, and to our panelists. Uh, it's great to be here again this year. Uh, I think this is round two for uh, the senator and I, so, uh, uh, and hopefully the final round. Uh, but uh, it's great to be here in Medfield. I am Jacob Ventura, uh, candidate for state senator here. Uh, since 2011, I have served as a staff member in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, uh, where I have assisted countless constituents, attended dozens of new business ribbon cuttings, presented citations at countless Eagle Scouts, uh, ceremonies, retirement parties, birthday milestones, and anniversaries. As a staffer, I have assisted senior citizens on fixed incomes, attained home heating assistance in the cold winter months, helped parents place their disabled child in adult daycare supervision, obtained access ramps for disabled veterans so they can enter their homes, assisted local businesses with regulations, uh, regulation issues at the Department of Revenue, helped folks in the construction business obtain the necessary licensing needed to operate machinery, and worked with our regional transportation authorities to improve the accessibility for seniors and veterans to travel to medical facilities and grocery stores. 
Finally, I've worked on securing funding for our local safety improvements, such as installations of uh, crosswalks for school children. I've assisted with securing the necessary funding for one of the top 10 most dangerous intersections in the Commonwealth, down in Seekonk, uh, which was a long needed improvement project. Together with this region's legislative delegation, I have assisted in securing funding for local public safety complex traffic lights. We helped secure $4.6 million for state road repaving and sidewalk installation. We assisted a local housing authority in acquiring state funding for senior citizen housing development. And we acquired $20,000 in the 2019 fiscal budget for a generator at a local senior center. Born and raised in southeastern Massachusetts by a working class family, my family roots are strong here in the Commonwealth, coming from Portuguese, Cape Verdean, and Wampanoag descent. I attended public schools, and I'm a first-generation college graduate, uh, graduating from UMass Dartmouth. I went on to learn, earn my law degree from Washington and Lee in Virginia, and started working in the financial services industry and banking. I'm proud to have the endorsement of Governor Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. I'll be an ally with them and their administration to benefit the town of Medfield. I'm also proud to have the endorsements of many of the regional legislative delegation, as well as local officials. We will work in a bipartisan manner to focus on strengthening our communities. And finally, I've been endorsed by the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses. I'll promote a great business climate here in the Commonwealth and support our local entrepreneurs. I look forward to having a uh, great discussion this evening. Thank you. So now we open to our panelist questions coming from our first one is Amelia Tarallo, answered first by candidate Ventura. Hi. So one of my best friends just graduated from nursing school, or finished her exams for nursing school, and she's a little concerned about question one. And uh, first I want to know, if there's a two-part question to this, if whether or not you support question one, and if vote yes, uh, what you will do to help nurses who don't feel comfortable with it and you know outline you know how to sort of ease their worries okay ventura yeah so uh you know first of all uh with these ballot questions i think it's very clear for uh, important for me to state clearly that i think uh, uh the will of the people uh, need to be respected while it's my personal opinion that question one probably not ought to even be on the ballot in its current form, I think it's six pages, it's very complex. Um, my preference would be to have that measure come to the legislature and uh, ha work this issue out through the committee process um, and the legislative process. That's my personal opinion um, because it's on the, on the ballot um, and having uh, reviewed the uh, independent health agency that came out recently, uh, I think they had uh, estimated that the concern conservative costs to additional uh, health care costs throughout the Commonwealth, I think we're looking at $676 million to $949 million in additional costs. Um, that report was a bit startling. Uh, second, uh, I've talked to folks throughout the medical uh, community in uh, this district. Uh, Sturdy Memorial Hospital comes to mind. They're a regional hospital in uh, Attleboro. Uh, and this approach is a one-size-fits-all approach. I don't think it's going to work for uh, some of our smaller community hospitals. Um, uh, you know, those types of hospitals and medical facilities compared to some of your bigger Boston-based facilities, uh, quite different. And uh, having this staffing ratio, I think, would cripple uh, certain budgets um, and impact uh, patient, uh, uh, patient care. Um, so again, I think it should be before the legislature, uh, and I think that would be the appropriate time to bring uh, all parties to the negotiation table, the Mass Nurses Association, as well as uh, the nurses who are uh, opposed to it, as well as the administrators. Um, so that's that. Thank you. And Senator Feeney. Thank you, Amelia, for the question, and congratulations to your friend who's becoming a nurse. We certainly need more of them, and I think that's what this question is all about. Question one, I will tell you that I am uh, very supportive of it. Um, as the vice chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, <clears throat> I dug really deep into this issue, listened to both sides, met with folks in the, uh, the hospital executives, I met with nurses, both union and non-union, to really understand this issue and greater, get a greater understanding of what we're seeing uh, day to day in the, uh, in the hospitals. I'll tell you that 
that I think the ballot uh, the ballot petition um, process is leaves a lot uh, to be desired. That I do wish that the legislature had the courage to do this years ago. I don't know if uh, Jacob Ventura would actually support it if it came to the legislature, but I'll tell you that the legislature had the opportunity to do it and they didn't. So that's why we end up with a question that's confusing people. For me, it's easy, and you, you can get down into the nuance of the issue. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, complications to this, but I'll tell you that the nurses, the nurses that are the bedside nurses that do this work every day, taking care of us and our loved ones in the hospitals, when they go home with an aching back and sore feet, and they think to themselves, did I do everything that I could for those patients today? And all too often in hospitals across the Commonwealth, the answer is, you know what, I didn't. I didn't because I had too many people to take care of. And it's not because they didn't want to take care of those patients, it was because they were told by managers and executives that there weren't enough nurses that they had to take on those extra patients. That's a problem. That's a problem. So when the nurses come to me and they make a compelling case that, Paul, this is an issue throughout hospitals in, uh, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and then the, the hospital executives then turn around and say, well, we don't want to pay for it. Look, I think the healthcare system is broken as a whole across this country, and there is a lot of savings that we can realize in healthcare. Let's start with executive compensation and the profits that they're sending overseas. Let's look at the reimbursement rates for those small hospitals, as my opponent was just talking about, and make sure that the big boys aren't necessarily eating up all those profits and, 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 uh, and, and really uh, affecting negatively the community hospitals. So there's a lot of savings in healthcare, time. but it belongs in direct patient care. Fantastic. I, uh, just as we go on, I, I appreciate the applause. I know it's an exciting time. We're going to, just to keep things rolling, we're going to ask to not applause after every time we speak. But uh, your rebuttal, Kennedy. Ventura. Sure, uh, uh, Paul, I, I believe I just said if this particular, uh, uh, as written, uh, I don't support it. So as a senator and as the next senator, I would not support this as written. Uh, this takes too much decision making, operational decision making uh, authority out of our local nurses uh, and physicians and administrators' hands. Um, and secondly, I think we need to be very clear, the Mass Nurses Association, which gave you $15,000 last year, they only represent 20 or 25 percent of the nurses in the Commonwealth. I've been knocking on thousands of doors, nurses throughout this district, and uh, you know, I think the, the polling numbers are accurate. I think there are many nurses who uh, are not comfortable with this staffing ratio as well. So um, those are the facts. Thank you. And our next question is from Anna Mae O'Shea Brook, first answered by Senator Feeney. There are so many questions and so many conversations that we need to have about awareness, funding, and insurance coverage surrounding mental health. But this particular question goes beyond just money. We need a cultural shift on how we speak about mental health conditions at the local level as there are stigma and shame barriers for people to reach out for help. How do you address the issues of mental health, depression, anxiety, bipolar, when you are meeting with your people on the local level as well as on the state level? Thank you for the wonderful uh, question. I will just to go back here, uh, suggest to my opponent that if he's going to make his decisions based on polls, that he probably shouldn't be elected. I never said lead. that. I didn't uh, say that. Look, we're, we're called to lead, and I think that the question you just brought up um, about awareness and mental health, it's not just a funding issue, right? We do have to change the culture, tra change, transform the way we talk to each other and the way we deal with each other. I am frightened every single day I see the Trump administration and the Republican Party with their talking points about how they're treating people, how they bully people. Imagine the anxiety. Imagine the anxiety that our youth feel these days. When we're sending them off to schools and we're talking about bullying and we're talking about how to treat people respectfully and they see President Trump and the leaders of this country completely devalue, completely devalue people and to talk about them the way they do, that is frightening. So the first thing we need to do is to be bold and to lead in our own districts, in our own communities, to start our own kitchen tables with our children and with our families, to carry that to the workplace. I'm thrilled to be the champion of a workplace bullying bill that was filed last year by, uh, by another senator who left the, the body and they came to me and they said, Paul, this is important. We've had alarming rates of suicide among workers because they're bullied in the workplace. And we have this kind of old 
old cultural mentality that we don't talk about it, or you know, this toxic masculinity that we can't deal with it. It's not just about funding, it's about stepping up and making sure that we treat each other with respect and dignity, and then we do it at every level, whether it's the local level, at the state legislative level, or my God, at the federal level especially. So we have a lot of work to do on that, but it's gonna take leaders that are willing to actually admit that it exists and then uh, fix it on their own. Thank you. Thank you, and your response. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, mental health is a huge issue that I think, uh, you know, Paul mentioned. Um, there has been a stigma over the last, you know, decades. Um, and this is an issue that this state uh, should lead the nation in tackling. Um, you know, again, I've knocked on thousands of doors throughout this district. I've had a chance to uh, meet a number of people. Um, this issue has come up. Uh, Paul mentioned uh, students, uh, whether it's bullying, uh, online bullying, um, I've talked to many, many veterans who uh, uh, come back uh, from combat and service who have issues, uh, mental health related issues. Uh, senior citizens, it's a rising concern among seniors uh, and suicide uh, mental health issues. Uh, and also, uh, we cannot forget our public safety uh, personnel, firefighters and uh, police officers who are uh, going in day in and day out and putting their lives on the line. Um, and the these issues um, translate into uh, um, uh, domestic violence that we need to tackle, um, opioid uh, addictions, uh, gun violence. So these are things that uh, um, very, very concerned about. Uh, and I hope um, in January I'll be able to tackle this issue. This is actually an issue that's very important to me. Thank you. And your rebuttal. To follow up on what I said earlier, Brett, and again, thank you for the question. Look, words matter. Words matter. And the way that we communicate with each other, the way that we communicate with each other at, in politics, the way that we run our campaigns, the way that we lead, the way that our teachers educate, words matter. We're setting an example for future generations. Mental illness is, uh, is something that isn't just, um, you know, doesn't just come by way of, of nature. It is nurtured. And we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to ensure that we're actually changing the way that we deal with each other. I'm proud that we talk about first responders. It, it runs rampant through many uh, first responders through the state, that I actually advocated for uh, increased funding to the on-site academy in uh, Massachusetts to deal with those issues for those first responders as well. Thank you, and our next uh, panelist question is brought to you by Gil Rogers, and with our first response coming from candidate Ventura. Perhaps the biggest and most difficult problem uh, from a development perspective is the state hospital. It's a very, uh, as has been pointed out, it's a very prominent um, part of Medfield, can have a huge impact on the future of the area. And as you know, a preferred plan has been uh, developed and is available for everyone to look at on the town website. And also an RFI has been sent out to try to get feedback from the development community on the economic feasibility of, the, of that plan. One of the key questions that we have is implementation. How do you go to the next phase in the plan? And certainly a key part of that is the financial aspect, the financial support. So for example, two things that are in the plan that are, are very important is that from a developer's perspective, you have to look on state and federal tax credits in order to make it a viable plan from a developer's perspective. Another key part of the financial aspect is the infrastructure costs. And we've done estimates that those could be on the order of $20 million, plus or minus 30%. So it's a, a big um, budget item to try to address. So obtaining tax credits and addressing the costs for infrastructure are two of the key implementation questions. So my question to you, and your responsibility as a representative from this area, how will you be able to assist in obtaining the financial resources necessary to make this a, a successful and uh, effective plan for the area? Sure, thank you for that question. And uh, I know we've discussed this in the past, this very issue. Um, 
uh, I think Representative Dooley in the last segment had mentioned uh, bringing stakeholders together. Uh, that's something I'm very familiar with doing on Beacon Hill um, and in our local communities. Uh, this is a federal, state, and local partnership, uh, and that's what you have to do. Um, as the senator, uh, my opinion uh, is that we let Medfield decide what Medfield wants to do with that property. Uh, and in my view, we do everything we can on the back end up on Beacon Hill to make that a reality. Uh, in my opening statement, I had cited uh, various funding projects, state grants. Um, you know, these things happen over time, but it takes uh, advocacy on Beacon Hill. I know how to do that, and uh, we need to do it in a bipartisan manner as well. Um, you know, I think it's very important with uh, this particular plan um, going off of your question now. Uh, you know, I, I agree with the, the emphasis on the arts community um, and uh, uh, looking at uh, alternatives uh, for alternative uses of that land and as well as um, uh, DCR controlled parcels. Uh, the state senator would uh, deal directly with uh, DCR and making sure that um, those state controlled parcels fit into the, the overall master plan of the town. But I think ultimately it's a Medfield decision, not a state senator decision. Our job is to make sure that we support uh, ultimately whatever the findings are. Senator Peter. Thank you, Gil, <clears throat> and thank you for all the work uh, for so many years that you and the, and the community have been doing. I am uh, I am blown away by the amount of study and research and planning and you know hundreds of meetings and planning sessions that have gone into this. I became familiar with it, as you know, in 2005 when I was my predecessor, former Senator Jim Timothy's chief of staff, and you know just a couple of years post closure and trying to figure out the decamp process and how we were going to release that land. And now here we are. Here we are with a great master reuse plan uh, that I think is. Uh, previous um, uh, previous attendees to the debate said, you know, we, we got to a place because of so many stakeholders and community people coming together and coming up with a plan. And I know that wasn't easy, so thank you. Um, you know, whether it's the, the state hospital plan, a lot three, and Hinkley, this is a you know this is a major project that should be a model for the uh, for community growth throughout the Commonwealth going forward. Um, what do you do as a state senator? Well, you know, one of the things that I've done in the last year since being elected state senator is to partner with our administration, the Secretary of Economic Development, to understand that each community has its own unique needs, but it really is about uh, regional issues. It's about regional growth. With the understanding that while you grow, you have to be careful with your resources. You know, the question comes up on transportation infrastructure, water, right, sewage. These are major issues that are facing Medfield going forward. As a state senator, it's my job to help us navigate through that bureaucracy, to make sure that we're getting grants from MassWorks for transportation uh, and other infrastructure. I was happy this year to work with a colleague uh, on our economic development bill to put millions of dollars into the MassWorks program exactly for items like this. Uh, so going forward, I hope to, to be able to kind of use the bully pulpit as a senator to advocate uh, for Medfield and to make sure that we're actually growing uh, in a smart way uh, that, 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 you know, and we can make sure that we get the, the, the uh, funding from the state to build to the infrastructure so that we can fully realize what the plan is in Medfield. And you have a 30 second rebuttal. Sure, and again, I, uh I just want to cite back to my previous experience uh, with this regard, um, whether it's transportation projects, uh, funding of local schools, whether it's roof replacement, uh, revamping of town greens, sidewalk installation. These are things that uh, it's our job to do. And uh, I think Paul and I actually agree on this issue. Um, whoever's uh, elected on November 6th, uh, 6th, I think, is going to be a huge advocate for Medfield State Hospital in this town. Um, and uh, I'll just close by saying, uh, with regards to infrastructure, uh, one of my That's main pillars time. on the okay. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I give up my final question to our Medfield High School senior here tonight, Kaylin Sheehy. Kaylin, uh, good evening. The platform you've been running on covers a wide range of issues. Should you be elected, what's the highest priority issue you want to address in your first day in office? And the first answer is coming from Senator Feeney. So this is a continuance of a work in progress since I got uh, elected a year ago. And thank you for, for being here tonight to see high school students and youth engaged. Uh, it gives me hope for the future, so thank you. Look, I, I, I have talked to thousands of people throughout this district as their senator, and I will tell you that there is an overriding kind of economic anxiety. And that economic anxiety 
anxiety comes from a lot of different issues. We talk, we silo it tonight, which we should, and talk about health care and education and jobs. But ultimately, they all fit together. Ultimately, they all fit together. People, people are very nervous that the, the health care costs are going to keep rising and they won't be able to afford it. Prescription costs, housing costs. We have a major issue here in Medfield. We have seniors that want to stay and, and age in place that can't afford the housing in a community that they helped build. So when we talk about you know one or two different issues, it really comes down to an overriding economic anxiety that's tied to health care costs, it's tied to, to jobs, making sure that we uh, making sure that we invest in 21st century jobs here in Medfield and in this region so that people understand where the next paycheck is coming from, making sure that we have enough housing stock like we're talking about at the uh, at the Medfield State Hospital property uh, and other places in town. You know, it's that overriding economic anxiety. I spoke with a friend of mine, a colleague in the Senate, and I said years ago the economic development bill would be that middle class bill. That bill where we ensured that we were taking care of, of, of people that were working to make ends meet. Uh, and I think we've lost our way over the years. Starting on January 1st, I'm going to make sure that we do everything we can to have a sweeping omnibus bill that addresses the cost of education, health care, and housing so that we take care of our communities like, uh, like Medfield. Thank you. Yeah, actually, great. Thank you for that question. Uh, I was finishing the last segment uh, with regards to infrastructure, um, and so this is a good segue. Chapter 90 and Chapter 70, uh, those are my two priorities. Uh, in order to increase Chapter 90 and 70 for our schools and our roads and our overpasses and bridges, uh, we need to uh, make sure that state government is being run as effectively as possible. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve on a local finance committee during a, a bleak economic time when you had to stretch a dollar. Um, things are going pretty well for the state right now, but I'd like to see us tighten up our fiscal controls at the state level. Uh, I think Representative Dooley mentioned uh, the ever-ballooning mass health uh, budget debacle, which is continuing to crowd out discretionary funding. We need to solve mass health uh, and, and make sure people who uh, need the care continue to get the care, but also make the tough reforms. Uh, we want to ultimately continue to increase the level of services that state government provides, but do it at a lower cost, and it is possible. Um, if you do that, you'll find savings um, in the state budget, and uh, with those savings, my plan is to increase Chapter 70, Chapter 90, schools and roads. Those are two of the biggest uh, components that I hear out knocking doors. Uh, you need a, a, a great transporta transportation system to move goods and services and people uh, in the 21st century, and you need great schools. Uh, so those are the things I'd like to do, uh, and continue to support Governor Baker uh, efforts at reforming state government. This is something he's been able to do in his administration. He's been able to find reforms along the way, reduce some of the, the cost of state government, and pass those savings on through increased local aid. So, In your rebuttal. Thank you, Brett. Making uh, government more accountable and um, I guess to the, to the citizens and the taxpayers is important. I think every every legislator should have that on the top of their mind. One of the things we talk about mass health and the ballooning costs of mass health, and all I've seen uh, as an answer from uh, from others is, you know, well, we'll just throw people off of it. And I don't think the answer to a broken health care system is to simply throw people off of a system here in Massachusetts, put more in an uncompensated care pool that we all pay for. Health care is broken. We need sweeping, bold, and over, uh, overriding reform to that system. That's your time. Thank you, Brett. Yeah. Your 30 seconds isn't enough to get the whole idea out, huh? Very tough. That's all right. <laughs> but thank you for your responses, candidates. Now we ask that the audience in attendance participates. Write down a question for the candidates, and we'll collect those, and our panelists will each choose one to ask. I know we have a bunch already, but if you haven't had a chance, just scribble something down real quick, and we're going to collect those, and in about five minutes, we'll have those answered for you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for submitting your questions. We now open to our audience questions. Our first question from coming from Amelia Tarallo, answered first by Jacob Ventura. So when I was in college, is this on? OK. Um, when I was in college taking political science courses, one thing that we went over is that not enough people vote, specifically in my generation. There's not enough people voting. There's you know a contrast in who is voting and who is not. Um, and something I noticed is that we are one of the only, one of a few states that do not have same day registration. And this question is, do you think that we should have same day registration? No, I don't. Uh, I, I support increased voter turnout. Look. 
Paul and I ran in a special election last year, and we spent thousands of dollars, and I think we had, what, a 12% turnout? So no, of course we want increased turnout. Uh, but uh, I also support security in our voting systems, uh, so I'm opposed to saying, uh, 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 same day voting registration um, for uh, security purposes. I think uh, uh, there, there, there's been too much going on across this country with uh, uh, international uh, threats on our election systems, um, uh, digital threats, uh, where at this point I would not be comfortable supporting that. But of course, I support increased turnout. Um, look, go to town hall, register to vote. It's simple. And your response? Uh, yes, I do support same-day registration. I think we as leaders need to do everything we can to make sure that we uh, make it as easy as possible for people to go out and vote. My opponent says it's that simple. You go to town hall, you register, and you show up to vote. It's not that easy for everybody. P proportionally throughout communities of color, throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it's become an issue. Senior citizens have an issue getting out to vote. Look, I have a great relationship with our Secretary of State who has done an amazing job here in Massachusetts to secure our election system. Um, we don't have an issue. Those are all Trump Republican talking points when they talk about security at the voting booth. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to turn people out, not to sit here and say, well, I want more people to show up. Well, what are you going to do? I was a supporter of automatic voter registration for a reason. I support same-day registration for a reason. Our country works best, our democracy works best when people participate and they take part. The second piece to that is as candidates and as leaders, it falls on us. If we simply go out with more of the same tired campaigning and politics as usual, where we throw out negative mail like my opponent hit me with last year and is continuing to do again this year, fake automated phone calls to voters like hit me in my campaign last year, what do you think that does to the process? There are people that want to have hope and be inspired and have a reason to vote. It's incumbent upon us to run clean, positive campaigns and give them a reason to come out and vote. Not simply to say, well, I want you to show up and vote, but I'm going to do everything I can to muddy the waters, make it difficult, and, uh, and, and run in a way that actually turns people off from elections. So I support same-day registration. I support a lot, of, uh, a lot of initiatives to make sure that we're getting increased uh, folks out to vote. I talk with students all the time in our district to make sure that they're registering early, which they can do now in Massachusetts. Uh, and then again, giving them a reason to actually show up and vote on election day. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what just came out of your mouth, Paul, but I will tell you this. Look, look, we all support increased voter registration among uh, all people, okay, period, all right? With regards to negative mail, it's not negative mail if I'm sending out something, uh, differentiating myself and you. You support sanctuary cities and sanctuary state, and I don't, and you're running from that record. I hope we get to that in this debate, but that's the mail. You voted for Amendment 1147 in Senate Bill 4 on May 23rd, and now you're running from that record. It proves my point. Uh, we can't, we can't point. differentiate ourselves? We can't differentiate ourselves, Paul? I think that's what we owe it to the voters, and to stand by your record, a right, record gentlemen. you're running from. Our next question is from Anna Mae O'Shea Brook, answered first by candidate, uh, Senator Feeney. Thank you. Do you support Maura Healy and Governor Baker's positions in eliminating bump stocks, background checks, and having police, police chiefs determine if someone should have a gun? That's to me, Brett. Yep. Uh, bump stocks, yeah, absolutely. I actually missed that vote uh, by a little bit. Uh, when I got sworn in last year after the special election, they had previously done that, and we had a, a, f uh, a formality vote afterwards, and I supported it and continue to support that. Uh, background checks, certainly. Uh, the ability of our police chiefs to be able to make the decisions on who in their communities can actually have a license to carry and own a gun, that is sacred in our communities. Who knows better than the police chiefs in our towns and the police officers in our towns who should have a license to carry and who shouldn't have that, that right to do that? Um, you know, my opponent uh, in a questionnaire last year made it clear that he wants to take away that authority from police chiefs. Imagine that. He talks about public safety, but imagine taking away the authority from our police chiefs on who should have a weapon in their community. 
that is criminal in my mind, and I certainly don't support that. I think we need to do more. We need to have common sense gun reform here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have some of the strongest laws in the nation, and it shows, and it shows. But it's not enough to just sit back and say, well, you know, I support the Second, second Amendment. We're not going to have any sort of regulations at all. That's not how this works. And we put our schools in danger. We put our churches, our houses of, houses of worship in danger. When we take away that authority from our local police officers and tell them that they can't decide who's going to have a license to carry, to vet people in our communities to have those guns. I think that's a dangerous idea and certainly not something that I support. In your response. Uh, chief, uh, police chiefs, bump stocks, and what was the third? Uh... Um, eliminating bump stocks, background checks, and having police chiefs determine if someone should have a gun. Yeah, look. Um, Massachusetts, Paul said, has the strictest uh, gun laws in the nation. We also have the lowest gun violence in the nation. Uh, whether that correlation, uh, that's a correlation between those two, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, I do believe in states' rights to uh, implement their own regulations on uh, uh, firearms ownership. Uh, that also being said, uh, we're one of the few nations in the world uh, who has a constitutional right uh, to bear arms. And that's a fact, whether you like it or you don't like it. Uh, we have a second amendment in this country which makes us very, very unique. Um, I've traveled abroad uh, doing legal work, on uh, constitutional legal work, and it's one of the most uh, uh, common questions I usually get is uh, people are just uh, baffled at our, our right to, to bear arms, and uh, uh, people internationally think that uh, there are guns everywhere. Look, at the end of the day, this is about public safety, and we can still uh, uh, protect people's second amendment rights, uh, and also emphasize public safety. Uh, uh, Paul mentioned schools. Um, look, we were down in Seekonk recently meeting with the police chief and parents and uh, administrators and teachers to go over training uh, in an event, uh, an unfortunate event. Uh, we need to make sure that we are emphasizing public safety as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Uh, just to, to follow up on, on what I just said, my, my opponent answered uh, in a questionnaire that he would take away the authority of police chiefs to, to issue a license to carry and actually mandate that they must do it. The second thing he said in that questionnaire is that he would defund the office of the Attorney General, our top law enforcement officer in Massachusetts. The Attorney General who protects consumers, who, 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 who you know ensures that we're fighting crime throughout the Commonwealth, he would defund her office because he doesn't agree with where she is on assault weapons. That's a dangerous idea. I think we need to do more. I'm a Second Amendment supporter. I grew up going right here to the Midfield That's Sportsman Club with my dad. But we need common sense gun control in Massachusetts. Thank you. And our next question brought to you by Gil Rogers. And the first response is from Candidate Ventura. I think one of the things that's on all of our minds is the tragedy that just occurred in, in Pittsburgh. And a realization that that can happen any place. It's not just Pittsburgh, it's not just uh, Florida, it can happen here. The question is, would you agree or disagree that President Trump bears some responsibility for the acts of violence that our country is experiencing? That's part one. And part two is, what would be your advice to the president? Uh, I reject the notion that President Trump has responsibility for that unfortunate situation. Uh, I don't buy uh, that narrative, what's happened in the media. This was a tragic incident, uh, and we send our, uh, our prayers to those families. Um, when we debated up here last year, uh, it was on the, the heels of the, uh, the Las Vegas shooting as well. Um, look, public safety is a cornerstone of my campaign, and we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to give our local uh, uh, county, uh, state, and federal law enforcement uh, the tools they need to make sure that we can prosecute people um, who are here uh, who shouldn't have guns uh, and protect the people. Uh, and again, common sense gun laws, which I'm for, Paul, by the way. Um, with regards to Trump, though, look, uh, I, I don't, you know, his rhetoric is sometimes off the wall. Uh, I don't agree with his rhetoric. Um, and uh, my advice to him would be to continue to just focus on the job. Be a little more like Charlie Baker. That's my advice to him. 
Thank you. Um, I, I'm heartbroken over uh, what we saw um, this past weekend at, at the synagogue, Tree of Life Synagogue. And uh, every every time something like that happens, Gil, I say, well, maybe we hit bottom this time. Maybe it's over. Maybe we can maybe we can finally come together and come up with a solution so that we're not dealing with kids getting shot in schools, people in our communities, in movie theaters, and now in houses of worship. Um, do I think the president bears some responsibility? Absolutely. And I said it earlier when we talked about mental health. Words matter. Words matter. We're called, we're held to a higher standard as leaders, whether it's a selectman in a community, whether it's a legislator, or if you're the president of the United States, your words matter. The way in which you talk, the way in which you deliver a message actually affects people. And, you know, to hear last year after the tragedy in Charlottesville, the president, to talk about neo-Nazis, neo-Nazis, the absolute dredges of society, and to say there were fine people on both sides, that empowers people. That empowers people that want to do damage, that want to do harm, that want to hurt people. We can't stand up for that. We need to be bold. And we don't, we don't need leaders that, you know, say, well, um, you know, I, I don't think he bears responsibility. I wish he wouldn't do it. You need to be bold. We need to take the words of Ellie Wiesel uh, into our own minds and hearts and realize that if we stay silent, if we don't stand up for the tormented, then the tormented wins. Words matter. And the, the words and the divisiveness that come from him and, and others in the Republican Party and his supporters uh, has a large effect on what we're starting to see through this country. Something has changed. Something is different. We need to address mental health. We need to address gun control. But we also need to lead and say that the way that the president is speaking about a lot of issues just doesn't fly. Here in Massachusetts, we should be the backstop against that. Our state senators should be the backstop against that. And, uh your rebuttal. Yeah, uh, the fact that you're using this tragedy for political points is an absolute disgrace. Okay, period. Um, now, with regards to the tone and rhetoric, this is something I feel very, very important uh, about. I do believe in bipartisan leadership. Uh, fortunately, here in the Commonwealth, uh, up on Beacon Hill, Democrats and Republicans work together on local issues. Um, and I think Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito have done a great job at uh, kind of ignoring the noise of Washington. And that's what my goal as the senator is to do, ignore the noise of Washington. That's and our final uh, audience question will be from our senior high school student, uh, Kaylin. Your question. Uh, how do you plan to help Massachusetts comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act? And that'll be answered first by uh, Senator Feeney. Thank you, Carolyn, for the question. Um, Look, first we need to be honest with each other. Global warming actually exists. Climate change is real. And despite the fact that some people find others that say that it doesn't exist, science is science. So we have to be real about the fact that it does exist. We see the ramifications of it here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I was proud this year to take a lead role in an environmental bill and an energy bill so that we could actually begin and, and we should have begun a long time ago, but that we could actually make changes that do our part here in Massachusetts. This is a global issue, no doubt about it. But when our president and, and, and his party aren't gonna do enough throughout this country, then we expect our leaders here in Massachusetts to step up and do what's necessary. So this year, as part of our energy bill, I made sure that I fought for incentivizing green energy so that we can put people to work in the solar, you know, the photovoltaic, wind uh, turbine uh, sectors. You know, that's important for us to do. The, the, at the same time, I stood up. I filed an amendment. I filed an amendment in that bill to say that in Massachusetts, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's divest from thermal coal. Let's take the money that we invest in pension funds and say it doesn't belong in thermal coal. Let's send a message there. And I was happy that my colleagues supported that in a bipartisan way, unanimously in the Senate. Um, those are the type. Those are the types of initiatives that we need to do here in Massachusetts. In incentivizing green energy, incentivizing clean energy, making sure that we're moving away from uh, from thermal coal and dirty energy having aggressive RPS standards, renewable portfolio standards, so that we're actually getting to a place where Massachusetts is relying a lot more on renewable energy in a shorter time frame over the next few years. Thank you. To repeat the question. Uh, sure. Uh, how do you plan to help Massachusetts comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act? 
Thank you. Uh, look, Massachusetts has led the nation in uh, reducing carbon emissions, and I think we need to continue that trend. Um, with exa uh, for example, uh, the Paris Accord uh, that the president uh, uh, withdrew from last year, I supported the fact that Massachusetts continued, uh, along with a host of other states, to continue those high standards. Uh, with regards to the renewable portfolio standard, which uh, Paul mentioned, we need to continue to increase um, hydro, solar, and wind. Uh, I think it was a good bill. I think it could go further. And I think when I'm in the Senate in January, I'm going to make sure that percentage of our uh, state's energy uh, increases. We need to continue to increase our uh, alternative energy sources um, and decrease natural gas. I'm also proud of the fact that uh, in the State House office, uh, uh, the town of Rehoboth, uh, the southernmost portion of this district, uh, there was a, a, a huge fight for uh, putting in a compressor gas station. Uh, we fought it. We filed three bills. Uh, that issue is now uh, dead for now. Uh, so we're against expanding gas pipelines. Um, probably an issue I disagree with many of my Republican colleagues on increasing the renewable portfolio standard. And uh, finally, um, you know, one of the issues that we don't talk enough about, and this is uh, something I've been trying to lead and will lead in the legislature, is energy transmission and energy storage. Uh, there is a lot of waste uh, when you go from solar and wind uh, to a consumer. Uh, estimated 30 to 40 percent of energy waste, and those savings we can pass on. Um, there are companies out there who have harnessed uh, AC and DC electric currents, believe it or not, and concurrently can flow those from source to source. If we could save tax pairs in the state, whether it's a university, a police station, a private consumer, whether it's a business or a house, 30 to 40 percent in energy costs through alternative energy, I think that's something we ought to do. So um, increase the RPS, uh, uh, decrease natural gas reliance, and then really focus on energy storage. That's time. Yep. And your rebuttal. To follow up on some of the initiatives that I took, and, and Jacob does great work as a staff member, but I want to be clear, those are his boss, that was his state representative that were doing that. I want to talk about my record and what I've done, and one of the issues that, that I saw was a compressor station that was down, uh, uh, proposed for the Rehoboth, Seekonk, Attleboro area in our district. I co-sponsored an amendment uh, and fought for an amendment with a Republican colleague, Republican colleague uh, from Weymouth. We fought for an amendment that would restrict the siting of compressor stations against what our leadership wanted us to do on that bill, um, but I thought it was the right thing for our district. I joined with my Republican colleague to get that done. Perfect. Thank you so much for all that uh, participated, wrote questions in, and, uh, and really got involved in this debate. I think that's uh, an awesome way that we have you guys get involved, so thank you. We now reach to the close of our event. Each candidate will receive three minutes to deliver their closing statement, and first we have candidate Ventura. I want to thank, uh, again, the panelists for uh, this rousing discussion, and Brett and uh, Medfield TV and the folks here at the high school uh, for putting on another successful debate. I want to thank uh, my opponent, Paul. Uh, Paul and I have been campaigning now against each other for almost 18 months. It feels like a presidential campaign, uh, but it ends in one week. So uh, the most important thing is remember to get out and vote. Uh, back to that question, uh, whether it's early voting uh, or on election day. Uh, and thank you to our uh, uh, dynamic audience. Over the past 18 months, I've traveled throughout all nine municipalities of the Bristol Norfolk District, including every neighborhood in this town. In an age where political campaigns are relying more heavily on technology to communicate, I decided to turn back the clock and commit to good old fashioned door to door campaigning. To date, I have personally knocked on 20, over 20,000 doors throughout this district. That includes Republicans and Democrats, unenrolled and independents, men and women, young and old, gay and straight, and people of all races. And I mention this uh, to make aware to the voters that a candidate can be no closer to a community in which they seek to represent than by truly knowing the community at a grassroots level, which means in person and face to face. This is best achieved in campaigns by visiting people at their doors. I've been immersed in the local issues. Medfield State Hospital uh, redevelopment, 40B housing and zoning laws here in Medfield, Chapter 70 education funding reforms, uh, to name a few. On the trail, I've talked to doctors and lawyers, teachers, nurses, police, firefighters, and people in the trades. I've talked to those who are struggling to find work and students trying to pay off student debt. I've talked to mothers who worry about school safety, 
and, and the fathers who just want their roads repaved. I've spoken to veterans who are struggling to acquire uh, the benefits that they deserve and seniors struggling to afford to live in the homes that they built years ago. These are the stories that drive me and inspire me to run for this office. These stories will not make it on the front page uh, headlines, uh, but they and the people behind them are what make our community strong. Solving these issues is what my prior public service has always been about. I want to serve the great people of this region and help make a difference in their lives. I've done it as a staff member in the House of Representatives, on a finance committee, and with your trust and confidence, I look forward to doing it as your next senator in January. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Feeney. Thank you, Brett. Thank you so much to the wonderful panel, our audience. Again, folks watching at home, uh, this is a true honor and a pleasure to have this opportunity to campaign. I always talk about, you know, as a senator, you get boiled down to sometimes into the nuances and the, you know, policy. But when you're out in a community, which is what I frequently do, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I treat this job with the reverence it deserves. I meet with community members throughout every one of the nine cities and towns of this district to understand what's important to fight, to be an effective voice for them on Beacon Hill and to bring Beacon Hill to Medfield, to bring Beacon Hill to our district. Look, I think you've seen tonight and, and, and over the last 18 months, as my opponent says, we've been running against each other. The choice is clear. The choice is clear. Look, we are in a difficult place as a country. Women's reproductive rights are under attack with the latest uh, confirmation of a judge. It's obvious that Roe is just one vote away from being overturned. People expect their leaders in Massachusetts to be a backstop to stick up for women and their reproductive rights here in the Commonwealth. Our senators must be a backstop to that rhetoric that we see throughout this country. Workers' rights are under attack. Members of the LGBTQ community are under attack nationally and even here in Massachusetts with question three, a ballot initiative that I never thought we would see. Yet my opponent, my opponent last year running a Republican primary, said, yeah, I would absolutely overturn those transgender protection Not true. laws. And then this year, running now, he took a different tack. People need to know where you stand as leaders. People need to know where you stand as a senator. They need to know that you're gonna fight for them, that you're gonna stick up for them, that you're gonna treat this job and the people of this district with respect. I've done that. I'm proud of my work as a state senator. I'm proud of what we've done over the last year. And I look forward to representing this district for a full term. I'm proud to be endorsed and supported by so many local leaders throughout this district, including organizations from Planned Parenthood, the Environmental League of Massachusetts, Sierra Club, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Teachers Association, the American Federation of Teachers Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Coalition of Police, the New England Police Benevolent Association, the Massachusetts Corrections Officers, Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, and so many more throughout this district. And while that support and those endorsements mean so much to me as we wage this campaign for re-election, it's your endorsement, it's your vote, it's your trust that I hope I've earned. And I want to ask for your vote once again on Tuesday, November 6th, for re-election. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I would like to take the moment to just say that uh, we are sitting in, in the Medfield High School Auditorium. When we come in to set up as Medfield TV, we take over uh, a little bit. And the Medfield Theater Society was, was always, they seem to always be rehearsing as soon as we come in. So I just want to plug their show as a thank you to them. Uh, they have a Midsummer Night's Dream. And it's uh, by, obviously, William Shakespeare. But it's on Saturday, November 17th at 7 p.m. right here. And it's Sunday, November 18th at 2 p.m. right here. So I want to thank them for, uh, for allowing us to interrupt their rehearsals. Uh, if you wish to see two, more of these two gentlemen, I got the pleasure to sit down with them uh, each and interview them. Uh, I feel like we've sat down for over an hour now over the past 18 months. You guys, you guys do this, and then you know, I get to, to talk to you all the time. But that is available both on YouTube and on our government channel, so you can check out uh, those interviews there. I wish to thank everyone involved in tonight's event. Again, the candidates, Representative Denise Garlic was with us tonight. Uh, Sean Dooley and candidate Brian Hamlin, absolutely. And of course, the two gentlemen sitting to my left, Senator Paul Feeney and candidate Jacob Ventura. 
our volunteers who helped us not only time, not only set up the, the stage, but also collected questions and, and went through those. Uh, Cheryl Dunley, Eileen DeSorga, Kelly Kyle, uh, Chris McHugh, Bonnie Wren Burgess, and uh, senior, uh, Kaylin Sheehy. So thank you guys so much. We work with, uh, with the schools, obviously, uh, the custodians that are uh, buzzing around. They obviously do a lot for us. They keep the place clean and, and set up for us. But also our uh, audio specialist tonight, Seth Hellerson, uh, Hellerstein, thank you. And our entire staff of Medfield TV at the Selectman meeting is Rachel Ferullo, and here tonight is Eric Giselle, Hong Lee Bruto, and Olivia Duvall. I am Brett Porter, reminding all of you to vote next week on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you for watching Medfield TV, and good night.